This is Georgina Rose, and welcome to the Postmodern Iconoclast, a podcast that helps you destroy and break the false icons and idols of the digital age in search of a more authentic esoteric spirituality. On this podcast, we discuss ideology, esoterica, and everything on the fringes of mysticism, religion, and related topics. Hello and welcome to the show. In this episode, I have a very, very special guest and we're planning on discussing egregores. So egregores are a topic that I feel like most people are aware of to some extent, or at least have heard going around. But specifically, I wanted to have this guest on to discuss how we as practitioners, and I know that's the bulk of what the people who listen to the show are, can interact with egregores and how does this actually impact us beyond what they are, what do we as occult practitioners need to know so that we, as we go throughout our practice and our spiritual journey and develop as members of the esoteric world, can have the strongest practice possible? Can you introduce yourself? My name is Mark Stavish, and I am the Director of Studies for the Institute for Hermetic Studies, author of uh, a few books on esotericism of which is Egregores, The Occult Entities That Watch Over Human Destiny, published by Inner Traditions, and uh, Cabal for Health and Wellness, and The Path of Alchemy by Llewellyn. And uh, Between the Gates, the book which many people think is probably my best work, which is Between the Gates, Lucid Dreaming, Astral Projection, and the Body of Light in Western Esotericism, and that's by Red Wheel Weiser. Lovely. So I just wanted to sort of start off kind of in the broadest sense possible. How do egregores impact our lives and our experience as individuals? Like, how does it affect us? Well, as I've said uh, in the book, and at times they are a limitation. And of course, we need limits. That's the nature of existence is limits. We encounter them and we decide whether there's something we can work within or something we can overcome. So an egregore, and of course we're always pronouncing this poorly, I just say I want the listeners to know that it is Greek and uh, we use the American <laughs> pronunciation, if you will, are uh, a collective identity of sorts. And that's really important. An egregore is always a collection. It's two or more. Okay. It's a group. It's not singular. So one way uh, to look at this is all egregores are thought forms, but not all thought forms are egregores. Okay. So when you desire to get something in your life and you want a new car, uh, that would be a thought form. But identifying with maybe working for General Motors or Toyota, uh, that would be more of an egregore, trying to put it in that context for folks. So they understand they're constantly moving in and out of this kind of relationship with egregores in that way. And in an esoteric sense, it's really what is the path which I am identifying with? What are the practices that I'm identifying with? So when we say, I am, and then fill in the blank, that's kind of where all the troubles begin. Because consciousness or beingness is, as we're told, is beingness. It is, I am. And there's nothing which comes after it. It's the totality within itself. But when we put a limitation on that, which is essential for our being, by the way. It's essential to have limitations in order to act and move in this world and in duality as a whole. So we say, I am blank. I am that. And that's where we begin to formulate a persona or a personality. Well, we do that in many levels. The personality which we bring to our life of employment may be very different from the personality we bring to our life at home. The person you are or the personality you present as a parent is probably going to be very different than the one which you present to your partner. 
So we have multiple personalities and we kind of move from one to the other, often very smoothly or some organically. And when we look at someone who has a very limited sense of personality, which is kind of always using the same tool for a variety of circumstances, we see that as ineffective. So when we engage in psycho-spiritual practices, and notice I said psycho-spiritual because a large part of this is psychological, it's to bring a great deal of flexibility and potential to our life, to have more complex and more uh, capable interactions with others and with ourselves. So we could say personas. The spiritual path which we pick, or paths, and sometimes we'll have more than one depending on what's happening, are part of those personas which we adopt. But they are not a permanent part of us. However, they can become so important to us that we identify with them to such a strong degree that they have the potential to dominate our lives and often in a less than desirable way. Interesting. That bit about the, um, the less desirable way was intriguing to me. Would it be possible for someone who is sort of interacting with a specific egregore for that egregore to kind of like really like leech off of them or do something kind of damaging spiritually to them? And if so, like how would that happen? Well, very simply, very naturally, very organically, really. What we have to do is we have to be honest with ourselves. And uh, the first thing is we have to be able to say to ourselves out loud, I come to this spiritual path. And again, the, the phrase is really psycho-spiritual because very little of it has to do with real spirituality or what we think of as metaphysics. Most of it is, and, and effective. I'm, I'm not degrading it here. It's effective, but it, it is, most of it is dressed up psychotherapy, whether we want to admit to that or not. And um, I come to this path because I am not happy with my life. There's something about my life myself that I wish to change. Now, when you can admit that, then you can begin to understand that process of change. And that we come to the spiritual path out of dissatisfaction. Because if things are going well, there's generally no need to go to it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I, I heard you kind of mentioning that sort of psychological, psycho-spiritual view on things. And I know that sort of debate, whether things are like externally metaphysical or more internally psychological, is a debate that I have heard from many different people. And I've had people on this show give actually very different opinions on it. Do you think that like sort of this view of egregores, it more fits into that psychological view of spirituality, or do you think it can kind of be applied to other views? Or do you think this kind of debate doesn't really hold a place in whether certain concepts exist or not? The debate doesn't hold water at all. How so? Because it's both. You cannot transform anything without what you should, which you have not first transformed within. The energies move in and through you. You are a microcosm. Therefore, the whole debate is spurious to begin with. You're going to go back and forth. You're, you're only able to engage and encounter what we would call these kind of higher dimensions to the degree that you can access them within yourself or close to it. There's a certain amount of grace that takes place in some of these things too, which modern schools tend to ignore. But there is an aspect of grace. So, you know... Um, as we say, the gods help those who help themselves. And there's always a helping hand ready to give us that pull over if we're close enough, if we've done the work. So the, the fact that we're talking about, is it internal, is it external, is irrelevant? I mean, we deal with um, external forces all the time. 
but for the most part, they're just an abstraction in our mind, like you are for me right now. You don't exist. You're just a construct in my mind and a and a name on a uh, on my computer. And that's the same with me for most of the, for the people listening to this. Yet I exist. Yet you exist. So we're constantly creating these these false notions of is it internal? Is it external? Well, it's both. And the purpose of the psychological part, which is the purification practices, which most of these groups, uh, magical groups, ignore completely. And the lesser banishing ritual to pentagram is not a purification practice. It can be, but it's generally not done as one. I had an interview earlier today with Peter Mark Adams, and we were talking about classical theurgy. And uh, one of the major things in classical work is the, the, the virtues, the culmination of virtues. It's something that many of these groups laugh at. They, they have no sense of virtue. Because the virtues are just intellectual abstractions, but in the classical work, a virtue is an attainment of a power, of real, of virility. It's a real psychic potency. It's not an abstraction. So what we attain within, we're able to experience without. And, of course, if we put enough energy into it, what we experience without can have a profound, you know, reverberating effect internally on us. So question about that. But it is it is our efforts which bring this into into being. It is our efforts which bring this into experience. I have to want to experience blank. And I, and just to be clear, what we haven't stated here is you are by uh, implic uh, you you are intimating that we're talking about uh, evocation of spirits for the most part. That's what we're, you're talking about, and that's what we're discussing. Um, we have to un engage in that. So that requires a strong amount of psychological fortifying and preparation to undertake and be successful at. So this inner outer thing is, is, uh, is a, it's not even a question. It, it, it's, it's for people who still want to stay very stuck in duality. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't other beings in this cosmos. There are. And we may encounter them. We're probably fortunate that we're not aware of them most of the time. There's many uh, uh, folks saying that says, you know, if you could see the amount of ghosts around you, you'd you'd be shocked. But again, shocked only why? Because of the lack of a personal psychological framework that can understand, accept, and appreciate that and integrate it. So this is a constant feedback loop. And same thing with the egregore. The egregore is a feedback loop. It is an identification with an ideal. In this case, we'll say an esoteric ideal, uh, or particularly that of an order, an esoteric order. That's where you see them most strongly. And many groups like to talk very much about their collective egregore, the force behind them. I believe that this Dion Fortune coined the phrase. She may have gotten it from somewhere else, but I thought she coined it, a fully contacted mystery school. Isn't that wonderful? mid 20th century kind of, I guess, British sense of occultism. Uh, fully contacted. I always wondered what is partially contacted, but uh, and contacted to what then is the question? And how do you get contacted and why do you have it? And why does someone else not have it? What makes you special? And we see this in the Theosophical Society with Blavatsky and the uh, Mahatmas, the unknown superiors. And we see it take a different shape or form with Alice Bailey. Amor has its own, or had its own. I think it still does to some degree. And of course, uh, you see the entire OTO and Thelemite crowd with various notions of what there constitutes their egregore or egregores. It's actually plural. So there's so much infighting there. It's multiple forces at work. And what you then begin to say, well, this is me. I am this. This is my ideal. And that's where the egregore begins to grab a hold of you and, and shape you. But you have to willingly agree to that. And then we say, well, on the spiritual dimension, what's there? And on that invisible dimension, it moves beyond just psychological to then metaphysical. 
and that we see this hierarchy of beings, this chain of beings. This is really no different than what you see in uh, various schools of Buddhism with uh, the Sangha. The Sangha is not just the physical practitioners, but all the practitioners, past, present, and future. And that means visible and invisible, where you have the unknown superiors of the uh, Golden Dawn and of the uh, Martinism, and the Elokohen, and the Rosicrucianism. So what are these invisible forces then that we seek to have some communication with? Because we look at the Golden Dawn, this was the major force, a major playing force in justifying the existence of the order. And of course, McGregor Mathers, he was their chosen vehicle. So said he. And then, of course, what happened, you know, with the third order, or was there a third order and all of that? So you can see the insanity that that brought. And it truly was insane. Yeah, I am often approached by people who are, you know, newer occultists who want to, like, consider, you know, getting involved with an actual order or an organization. Um, and I, I have noticed a lot of these organizations do kind of boast about this stuff. What is the actual benefit for a individual practitioner for getting involved with sort of the egregore and the spiritual body of these groups? What does it actually give us? A sense of purpose, an identity, community, for better or worse. That makes We've sense. We've seen, you know, and when you're beginning this, you need a coach. And when you're doing this, if you have a coach, and you're in a solo sport or a solo activity, at some point it's easy to walk away. But if you have a coach and you're on a team, or it's a team project or something, team you know, activity for the state or national science fair, it's harder to walk away. Other people are depending on you. So being in a group helps us to take some degree of responsibility while giving us a support network, assuming that the rest of the people in the group are capable of support. So before joining any organization that has regular meetings that you're expected to attend, it's important to spend some time around those people and ask yourself if you want to be like them. Are these people I want to be like? Well, ask them, what has this done for you? What are the benefits you've gotten from it? And they should be willing and able to answer. That makes sense. So is it possible that you mentioned earlier, we're talking a little about how certain egregores can be damaging to you. And obviously with all these groups, they would all have kind of their own egregore to them. Would you need to really carefully like vet the group to make sure it's not like a really poisonous egregore? Like, would it be possible that you could like join an occult group and it turned out that the egregore of that occult group is like really bad for you spiritually? Or is that kind of just like a not possible scenario? I think there's too many factors involved. One is your own desperation to join a group. You know, what are you picking from? What's available in your area within a reasonable distance? I mean, as, as much as there is out there now compared to, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, you know, th this still isn't like, you know, getting a loaf of bread or, or, or going for a coffee and saying there's a Dunkin' Donuts on, on every other street corner. You know, there's the, the amount of available groups out there really is fairly limited when you look at the, the scope of the population and people interested. Because running a group, an organized entity, takes a lot of time and resources. And what I have found is that most practitioners are unwilling to make the sacrifices required for a healthy and effective group. 
That's why so many of them are toxic. Now, if you can, there should be some red flags that go up. And, you know, my thing is slow to get in, fast to get out. You know, if the group is too quick to want to get you in, you know, just that's a red flag right there. You know, you should take your time. Take your time to get in. But also be careful about the so-called secrets. Uh, I find that most of them don't really have any secrets or anything worth calling a secret. I may be wrong, and I don't claim to know everything or by any stretch. Uh, however, it's going to if they do have something of true, super exceptional value, and they're good, it's going to be slow process of meeting you. They're going to be vetting you just as much as you're vetting them, and that should be clear. Uh, I hope that helps. No, that definitely does. Actually, I wanted to circle back to something you said a little earlier that I hadn't kind of ask you about but i've been thinking about is you mentioned that a lot of people think the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram does something besides what it actually does and that's something that i have noticed a lot when i'm talking to people about the lbrp i think a lot of people learn the lbrp because they're told that it's like an important stepping stone in becoming you know a ceremonial magician or something what does it actually do well it's a very nice training mechanism and it gives you a basic ritual that gives you something to do which you know ritual is action it's an activity and ritual is designed to harmonize our thought word and deed and those of you who remember sunday school remember that is it you know we have sinned and thought word and deed and that comes also from uh, judaism which got it from during the babylonian captivity you see the same notion mentioned in both Indian and Tibetan Tantras, where body, speech, and mind, or body, energy, and, and mind. So you have thought, word, and deed, and you have to integrate or bring these together. And ritual allows us to do that. So it's a very nice ritual for doing that. And truth be told, there's no such thing as an advanced ritual. There's just an advanced application that you have internally of whatever you're doing. So, you know, Crowley's statement about, uh, you know, the LBRP being the, the sum of all things or what have you, there's a fair degree of truth to that. Now, if you really know how to use it, but that's through your own inner experiences and practices that are maturing. Well, what we do in the beginning with it is essentially it prepares the mind and the space around you. Now, by preparing the mind, it brings focus to the mind, but it doesn't inherently cleanse the mind. Because the only way you can have a purification is by recognizing what it is that needs to be purified. So, again, on the tree of life, you have virtues and vices. And you can look at the virtue and say, okay, well, what's the, what's the vice? What do I have to stop doing here? I have to stop being lazy. I have to stop being selfish. I have to stop being violent. I have to stop being lustful. I have to stop being uh, debaucherous. You notice I'm working up the tree here. I'm talking about the, if you notice them, these apply to each of the spheres, each of the planets, right? Yeah. I have to stop this. These are the seven. Well, there's more of them. There's more than seven on there. But, you know, so different systems have different numbers of virtues and vices. And you have to be honest with yourself. I want to go talk to the gods, but I want to drink heavy. I want to do lots of drugs. I want to talk about relationships but i can't commit to one person okay fine just recognize that you know the gods these forces uh you know they know us in some ways better than we know ourselves 
because they can see it. They can smell it on us. That's why we do ritual baths to cleanse the smell. We, we stink to the invisible. So we have to look at what we're doing and how we're leading our lives. How are we treating ourselves? How are we treating others? And then to that degree, we're capable of climbing this cosmic ladder, if you will. We're capable of ascending through the spheres. I really like the way how you explain that, how we kind of do have to clean ourselves before we can, you know, move up. Are there other things that we need to do before kind of interfacing with these higher deities, higher beings and higher forces for them to sort of want to work with us and not, you know, see us as stinky? Well, stop being stinky. And that means you you have to recognize that it's about relationships. Many people, they come to occultism in particular because they want something. And they're really only just focused on what they want. And it can be a legitimate need. Please understand that. We need to eat. We need clothing. We need food and shelter and transportation. And we need some of the basic luxuries so that life isn't just a, an endless grind. However, when you think about it, how many of these people haven't you met will grab a copy of some grimoire? Exp they've done nothing to warrant it. Expect to go perform some magic in which they're going to call upon the forces of the Holy Trinity, which they don't even really believe in, to protect them from this demon which they're going to invoke and compel it through threats to do something for it, for them. I mean, think about the relationship there. Well, there is none, not an unhealthy one. Okay. So we have to remember our relationship to others and in that lodge, in that temple, is going to be to some degree a reflection of the relationship that we're going to bring to the invisible. So it's, if you don't bring something to the table, uh, don't expect anything. And that's where the egregore kind of fits in, in, in a way. You have a relationship with it. You ask things of it, so to speak. But it also asks things of you. Now, hopefully you know what those things are, and it's agreed upon, and it's understood. But there's times when it may not be, and that's where it may be negative. So how are you going to know this? Well, if you're using the virtues and vices as your checklist and some common sense, then you'll be able to get a sense of, okay, this is something I want to participate in, and this is something I don't. But, you know, if you're, if you're selfish... If you're not, if your sense of generosity is telling other people how to vote and to pay more taxes to support your causes, well, that's your idea of generosity. Well, what are you doing? How are you leading by example? You know, what are you doing? What are you going out of your way for? How are you helping? And that's where the, the invisible is going to kick in. And you can look at any aspect on the tree of life and see this. I mean, particularly, we'll say Netzach or Venus, right? Relationships. If you don't bring a sense of uh, tenderness and kindness to the relationship, how far can it go? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You kind of do need to work on the, you know, the microcosm to affect the macrocosm. I, I've seen a lot of kind of attitudes about occultism be just that, especially how you described your sort of that Solomonic example of the person commanding without believing. And it got me sort of wondering about like belief. I think that it probably like, like you do need to, you know, think about what you're actually working with and interfacing with, but how important is belief? How much do you need to believe? Well, you need to, it's all about belief. 
Agrippa was quite clear on that. All of them, everything is faith is everything. If you don't have the faith to, to risk it, to undertake it, you're not going to have an experience that will build confidence based on knowledge. So belief is everything. The problem is with the way this is, and I'll go back to the, the Solomonic practice because it's something some listeners may be familiar with. When doing it decontextually and sort of on your own as a do-it-yourself kit, you simply don't, most people simply don't know enough to know what they're doing. They're not certain. So their uncertainty creates a disequilibrium in the ritual. It creates a ripple because I'm not certain and I don't have anyone to ask. I don't have anyone to call upon and there's no one there with me and I'm all alone. But I desperately want it to work, but I'm terrified of what will happen. See, all these forces are coming into play. And it can be with other types of rituals too, but that one because they're so uh, dramatic and potentially harmful. Well, now let's say you've done it and maybe it didn't work out too terribly well and you weren't certain, but hey, there's enough emotional juice coursing through you that, well, you light up the astral like a fresh slab of ham at the buffet. So you get attention, for better or worse. So even if you weren't terribly uh, faithful, if you will, you can still get some results and attention from the invisible. Happens all the time with kids with Ouija boards. They don't really believe, but they screw around long enough and often enough where they scare themselves. Something happens and they scare themselves. And that's the same way with a lot of these practices, a lot of them. So the belief is ultimately you have to have belief in yourself and your own well-being, but where does that then fit in cosmologically? If you don't have a uh, philosophical view, as a, the proper philosophical view as a foundation, we call the magical worldview, then you're just kind of winging it, which, it, by the way, which is the way most modern magical groups go. I mean, the, the Golden Dawn, as much as I like it, it does not have a philosophical foundation, really. It has a lot of techniques and a lot of things, but it's not as if you get instructed in the philosophical magical worldview. Uh, someone told me you get that later on, but geez, but if you don't get it till you're a six five or a seven four, I mean, what 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 use is it then? That's that's the foundation. And I know a lot of these other organizations don't as well. So then when things go bad, as they inevitably always will for everyone at some point, you know, you how far do you fall? And what is the foundation that you've got to pick yourself up again? And that's where egregores come in because they act as a bit of a safety net. For better or worse. Yeah, I remember about, I think this was about a year ago, a year and a half ago, there was some kind of discourse within the online Thelemite sphere um, about this, where basically a few people were frustrated that a large swath of people who are calling themselves Thelemites really kind of didn't have a backing to what Thelema was. They kind of had diluted Thelema to somewhat of kind of like a, a meaningless term. Um, and I was wondering... What do you think are some key philosophical foundations of the magical worldview? What like basic ideas should we understand so that we're not at that point where we're super deep into say like the golden dawn system and we're just now getting some of this footing? The fundamental nature of the of the cosmos can be explained in the uh, the Corpus Hermetica. Um, and if we look at that, we see that the cosmos, that is the, the universe, the all, is a living entity. 
that moves on a spectrum, if you will, from non-being into being, and then from being into this very dense reality we experience as life. And along this spectrum are a variety of planes or spheres or loci of consciousness, worlds even, that have their own unique functions or aspects. And that we, that is human beings, do not have just one of these, but embody all of them in seed potential. And that is our function, our purpose here, to activate those seeds and bring them into fruition and completion. We call that the path of return. And as we do this, we undertake the path of initiation, interior initiation. And at some point, when this is done well enough, we will have achieved what's called the Philosopher's Stone, or adepthood. And at that point, and only at that point, will we be 18 or 21, will be an adult in the universe. We haven't reached the end of the journey. We've just now actually begun to undertake the journey. It's sort of like in martial arts. I like to say that uh, you're not really a martial artist until you're We'll say a black belt. At that point, you're able to be taught. You're able to learn, to give a, I guess, an analogy. So when you understand this, and that your function is self-awareness, and with that self-expression of those capacities and potentialities and powers, then you fo- then you focus more on what does it mean to be and that being means to create of our own efforts as levy said and as the egyptian papyrus say you know we create an awareness a self consciousness that is able to withstand the intense pressures of the knot from which we have come. And that is what is referred to as uh, the body of light or the indestructible body, consciousness. So you had mentioned um, initiation very briefly, and I know that's something that a lot of people, they really desire to undertake. Um, And I've, you know, there's certain systems that have more than one initiation, um, but kind of the question I was wondering is, what is your view on, like, people who do self-initiations as opposed to, like, group initiations? Or are they kind of just serving different purposes, or should you only do group initiations? Like, what ones should you actually do? All initiation is self-initiation. All initiation requires that I, of my own free will and accord, enter into this agreement to undertake this experience on this path with this practice. Now, whether I do that alone in my closet as a temple, or whether I do that in a temple or in a rented hotel room, is almost irrelevant. What does matter, however, is that the intention and the purpose be clear and precise in an understanding of what the obligations are. All initiation has some kind of oath and obligation at that point, as far as organizations are concerned. If you're with an organization, it's important that the people performing the ritual are at least at that level of the ritual or higher, that they can at least temporarily create a necessary, we'll call it energy, to give you a glimpse of what that ritual is symbolically representing. Because of that, we can say that most ritual initiations 
do not pass that test, but they are still useful because they can provide the candidate with a symbolic template, a symbolic guide of what is happening within that structure or order. So for that reason, you know, it's far better to have a good initiation outside of a group than a poor one in it. But it's best if you can have a good initiation with a group and that that group is capable of providing enough energy so that at that time, the critical point of the ritual, that you can have a breakthrough or a glimpse into the invisible that the initiation is supposed to provide. So you mentioned like um, when you take an initiation, you're often taking some sort of oath or agreement. How does that sort of work magically? And what would happen if someone were to hypothetically break an oath? That's always been a difficult question because sometimes you're made to take an oath to things that are kind of uh, either not understood or they have a symbolic meaning, again, a symbolic meaning you may not understand or it's something that may not always apply necessarily to the time and place you're in. But you have to take it of goodwill. And, uh, for example, I have Masonic initiations. I'll talk ab about them, but I'll never describe them in detail. And I'll even say, well, if you want to know what goes on, go read that book. Go read Blank and Blank. Or go better yet, go join a lodge. I haven't told you. So I've kept my oath. Now some will say, no, that's not strict enough. Well, you know, let's not be silly about it. Uh, I haven't told you the key parts. We haven't described the key parts. Therefore, it's useless to you. But the kind of initiation that matters most is the interior initiation. All ritual initiation is simply a theatrical presentation designed to create outer conditions that will stimulate an inner response. So, ideally, the thing which matters most is your inner awakening on each of these levels. We call them levels. I think of it more as an expansion than an ascent, by the way, because you're, you don't leave things behind. You absorb them and integrate them and expand with them. So it's not like an initiate of Netzach is no longer intellectually capable, you know, because they've left hood behind. It's not like that. It's, in, it's, in, it's an integration process. And that's what matters most is your personal integration, your personal initiation, which is going to happen regardless of ritual work or not. That's going to be the degree of your effort towards your awakening. How do you know when you are sort of ready to take the next step in your journey and embark on something like an initiation? That's up to you. If you don't know, don't do it. Yeah, but remember, you got to be an adult about this. You're responsible for yourself. No one else is. Join an order. You're 18. There's a time when you had to be 21. So you're an adult. This is do not pass go, do not collect $200, go straight to jail time. So we have to recognize that. We're not dealing with children. And one of the problems with contemporary cultism is that it is fundamentally a publishing industry aimed at children, 15 year olds, 15 to 25 year olds. Uh, let that sink in. So it is going to be very difficult to get the level of maturation necessary. There was a time when you couldn't study Kabbalah until you were 40. That's because all your stuff was behind you, all your obligations. So we have to look at what is the level of maturity that is required to undertake this work? What is the level of dedication, 
and devotion and sacrifice. And that all depends on what you expect to get from your work, from your practice. Each group is different. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think your your with your point about the publishing is interesting because I do think there is kind of a gap between a lot of the really sort of beginner occult books that people pick up at say a local bookstore versus like how your practice can actually go when you get like deeper and deeper into it. And I've noticed there's this phenomenon where a lot of what's being written and discussed is sort of very, very entry level stuff. Um, where can you look to sort of learn things that are at a higher level of maturation? Or is that at that point more just your practice sort of guiding you and the spirits themselves guiding you? Well, you go to the Institute for Hermetic Studies and you take our courses like college courses and you learn like an adult. And you take responsibility for your work. And that's what you do. And the reality is there's very few places like that in Western esotericism. In fact, so few that we have people in, in uh, Europe wanting to, who are working with us on replicating what we're doing here and to bring it over there. And, you know, if you could do it on your own, you would. And if it worked on your own, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And that really needs to be brought home. You know, you need to have someone help you who's capable of helping you. That's the other part. Not just someone who, as a teacher, but someone who's a capable and accomplished teacher. Uh, and, can, and knows how far they can guide you, what their limits are, too. They know themselves to know what their limits are. And that teaching is going to be based upon what you need to learn and what you want to learn and why. Now, when you join, and, you know, I'm just going to kick this around because it's known to people, not for any other reason. But, you know, see, so you join the Golden Dawn. And you have to learn all this astrology and learn all this geomancy and memorize all these tarot cards. You know, none of that's essential. None of it at all. Now, is it useful? Well, it can be, depending on, on what you're doing with it, but it's not essential. So what is the goal of the practice? What is its purpose? Is this purpose, how is this going to help you when you're dead? I mean, that's really the big question. How is this going to help you when you're dead? Because classical work is about, you know, how do I survive the afterlife and how do I survive coming back and how do I survive the pressure of of the not of the non-being of the of the uh, we would say the beyond duality the crushing weight of Saturn how do I survive that how do I cultivate the mental capacity that allows me to to recognize and real realize that so when we look at these practices, we have to bring all that to mind. We ask that question, what, what is this going to do for me? And it's the same thing with people who are always doing some kind of divination before they do some ritual. I say, well, if you don't know whether you should do a ritual or not, don't do it. I'm sure most of the, the magic isn't so powerful that it's going to have the immediate effect you want, regardless of whether or not you were certain it should be done. <laughs> There seems to be a bit of contradictions in that. So, again, what is the purpose of the work? And, you know, again, egregores help us to do that because they give us something to attach to in the not, in the, in the non-being or after-death state. The uh, community of saints, the chain, the golden chain of initiation, the hierarchy, it gives you something that, you know, our Western variation of a, you know, a Buddha field. How do you, you know, that that's where a, an egregore can come in handy for many people. How would an egregore, like, I, I guess maybe this is a question that can't even be asked to a living person. How can an egregore actually help us in what comes after this life? Or is that... I guess kind of more difficult to question to ask anyone living. 
Well, as I just said, it, you know, when you look at the rosary, and the rosary is, you know, you know, be with me in my hour of death. Be with me in my hour of death. When you're looking at the people in that ritual chamber, how many of them do you want with you at your hour of death? Yeah. That's a really good thing to think about, I think, when people, you know, look at groups and teachers and all that. Because I think sometimes people are like, oh, I want to get this teacher for this reason. But I think that's probably like the best question to circle back to. I feel like kind of a theme that's been underlying this whole conversation is sort of the why of magic, which I do find is kind of lacking in material that discusses it. Like, why are we doing things? What is the point? What is the aim? And I think that's, that's because, the thing that you always need to be asked. Well, that's because it's, it's, it's broken. The systems are broken. If you look at a, a classical system, the classical system has an exoteric component. And that's the historical, moral, ethical teachings. And with that, mythic teachings too, okay? Mythic history of the religion. And of course, religion is designed, comes from the root to unite, to link, to yoke. Okay, so it's valuable. Let's not pretend it isn't. And too many in the modern magical community and their snarkiness are, are too quick to uh, uh, reject that. Yet at the same time, they're trying to then do initiation. Now, what comes after religion? That's religious mysticism. And that's personal experience with the divine. So in religion, it's I, thou. I'm here and God is thou up there and big and distant and king. Maybe unapproachable. In religious mysticism, it's I, thou. But God comes down to our level at some point, so to speak. Our king becomes a friend that we can speak with. And if you look at the religious literature, the mystical literature, I mean, you see these spectacular uh, experiences that many people had from religious devotion, which is a key here because what we see is missing in modern magical practices is devotion. It's looked at as very mechanical when the devotional element is missing. And devotion is what makes it work. Now, the next level after that is now what we call the truly esoteric or the truly interior. So the first path is often what not to do. The second path is what to do. Okay. Now, the interior path is the path of, we'll say, where you're doing things, you're changing things, you're manipulating energies. You're learning magic, you're learning alchemy, you're learning Kabbalah, how to change things and situations. Not just ignore them or hope that you can kumbaya your way out of them, but you're learning how to change conditions within yourself and around you. And that is an initiatic path. But then where does that lead? If that does not lead you to direct experience in which all of that falls away, then it becomes an end in and of itself, and that's a dead end. It's like taking a road all the way up to a river and finding no bridge to the other side. At that point, you either have to drive your car into the river or get out of the car. And the vehicles, that is the spiritual mechanisms, the vehicles which we use for so long, we invest a lot of time and energy and resources into their maintenance and using them. And we often do not wish to abandon them when it comes time to cross the river. Other people seek to abandon them too quickly, as if they don't need them, and then they fall back and they have nothing to fall back on. So it's a it's a continuity is what I'm trying to point out. And the magic is in the second or in the third level, and you have people trying to do it without any understanding of the first two or where it's leading in the fourth. 
Yeah, that bit about devotion is something that I have thought about and talked about a bit. I feel like a lot of people view the spiritual world, and this is like my little metaphor. I don't know if probably someone has said this before me, but um, I call it the spiritual ATM. Like people think they put in ritual and they get out thing. And I don't think that's the best way to view the spiritual world. But I think it is kind of like, no one will say it directly like that, but I feel like it is an attitude people have that I really wish people would kind of move away from. Um, well, it, it is. That's again, that's why I said earlier, you're, we're treating this, these beings as if it's an ATM that you can just insert your card and, and get something back without having to put it, without having to make a deposit to begin with. So it's more like a form of, uh, uh, you know, I, I call it metaphysical, uh, uh, welfare. You know, I'm going to get my, my, my debit card and I'm going to get what I want. You know, it's kind of like the people are going to be enlightened just because they happen to be at the right place at the right time. Um, you have to put something in to get something out. You have to create relationships with your co-workers, your lodge workers, and you have to create relationships with your the invisible. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're going to have a very lonely path. I mean, how, you're going to be trans... What, what's going to happen? You're going to talk to God, talk to God directly. You're not going to be transformed by this? <laughs> or wait, you're only going to wait until you're transformed to make something worthwhile of your life. You know, it's an ongoing process, an ongoing feedback loop. And, and if you if you... Well, you know, the gods help those who help themselves. If you want uh, the assistance of the invisible, you need to show that you are worthy of it. Yeah, I think that's a really beautiful note to sort of conclude the show and this episode with. Um, I think these are all questions that us as occultists and as esoteric practitioners need to be asking, because I think a lot of this stuff isn't thought about as much as it really should be. These are the big questions that we need to think about and like really reflect on as we go throughout their journeys. And if you're listening to this and you're a really new practitioner, like I know many of my listeners are, these are stuff to be thinking about even from your onset, because you do want a good foundation for the spiritual house you're building. So thank you so much for coming on. Where can we find you? Where do you exist? Um, what if your work is out in the world? All you got to do is Google me or Amazon. I'm out there. But the Institute for Hermetic Studies, you can find us uh, again. You can Google us. But we have a platform on Teachable. And uh, we have a free course. It's six hours. It's uh, Unfolding the Rose. It is it's very important foundational information that we've talked about here. You sign up for it and just listen to it at your leisure. And there's a lot of printed material that goes with it. It's not just the audio. It's the other material that you can read and download. And then we have some other uh, no-cost programs up there as well, some of our conference presentations and other things. So that's Institute for Hermetic Studies at Teachable. And if you want, you can email us at info at hermeticinstitute.org. And, of course, you can Google Institute for Hermetic Studies, and you'll find our website. You can email us off there as well. Lovely. Uh, I am your host, Georgina Rose, or Dot Darling on the internet. I host this show and I can be found on all corners of the internet under the name Dot Darling, mostly on YouTube. That's the place you should you should check me out. Um, and if you want to keep this show running, you can support us on Patreon. And if you're a high tier patron, I will read your name out at the end of the episode. So special thanks to Ruben C. Trevino, Shiraz, Emil, Bergeland, Neva, Fuller, Lee, Smalter. Thank you so much for keeping this show running. Um, if you join the Patreon, you get all these episodes early. My pre-show, which is a solo episode that I record right before the guest comes on, or it's just me sort of rambling about something. Um, you get also a bonus episode every Neo-Pagan Sabbath. So that's, that's always fun. Um, and thank you so much for listening. If you are on a podcasting platform, please leave us a review, unless it's a bad review, in which case do not leave us a review. And if you're on YouTube listening to this there, 
please like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell. We so appreciate you continuing to listen to this podcast. This has been the Postmodern Iconoclast, and have a lovely day, night, afternoon, mid-morning, mid-evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are. All right, bye.